Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. I want to also, I want to thank all the names that uh, some prepared that Dr. Eden mentioned before. Thank them from the bottom of our hearts, B'Shem Kola Kihah. To all those, all the sponsors tonight, to all the past sponsors, future sponsors, Ashraif and Lamesh Kola Kavot, to those future sponsors also. But definitely for the Saturday night tonight happen, and to the Chavirim, the Chavirot of Kihah, Shilad Rehim, Ashraif and to the Vaalei Yadkar, and to everyone that set up to make this uh, our first, our first Hilula of Reb Nassim, this, this feeling this special and this warm and this right. So, first of all, Bermet, thank you and thank you everyone for coming. Nisim of Bermet is uh, going to be here, Bermet, uh, in the next few minutes. Depends how long minutes are in your calculation, but no, it will happen. All, there's other Shem, everyone should feel good. And tonight's an evening of uh, real debates and Amuna and Chizuk and Bitachon and the Schuss of the Nasan, which we'll be speaking about. But uh, since we're here, this is where we dive in. I want to sing a nigun with, with the Chaber that are here. I'm sure they know this nigun, and those that don't know yet, this is a nigun that has really become, I guess, uh, one of our anthems. Actually, I
and sing, or both, but <laughs> everything it has to be one or the other, okay? <laughs> so then, I am the
welcome again, everyone. Those in the back, come and grab a seat. Thank you again for coming. Tonight, also, I want to thank all the kids that are out here tonight. You should call for coming. All the kids are here Especially my cute my cousins from Big Chemish that are here. You should call for coming. I'm 
very, very talented neshamas, which is the rov, and it's the majority, that they, they have so much to do, they have so much to give, they have so much to bring to the world. But it may not necessarily be this total, total chiddush. It may be the art how to master to re-dig wells which we want to know. And she felt that if you tell that to children, as they go about when they're not just children, any age, you tell that to someone, and then the Kriya Voga, and the Rebbe has a, the Bible shares is a long sentence, that our door, bless you, is not so much about learning tradition. Because let's face it, I mean, Am Yisrael is the gift we were the Amma Sefer, Sparim upon Sparim upon Sparim, which Rebbe Nassim speaks about in his passion, the gift of the printing press, which Rebbe Nassim Mekadish sanctified to the highest, highest level. It was most significant for what a printing press could do. You and I are sitting here because really of, a, of sanctifying a printing press, if you think about it. But Rebbe Nassim mastered more than anyone ever mastered since the time of Yeshua to Moshe Rabbeinu, the art of re-digging wells that were already dug for us and bringing, to, bringing it to life for us today. Think about it, safer after safer, we have all this farm in front of us. But we're always looking for the next thing. What's new, what's new, what's next? And I've not seen says, it's really, it's a third in the Shabbos. We look at Elochos, Elochos Yain Nasech. We once learned this, this week, when we were in Brasco, we learned this by his, by his Tzian once, I believe. If not someone says like this, look, look at these words. Listen to these words. Malachas atfus v'chesed adol. She'al yedei zei yecholim lehat pis farim harbei mehod. She'al yedei zei lo tishtaka chatara m'yisrael. If not someone said the printing press, the avodah, malacha, a literally printing is such a chassad from a Kaddish Baruch Because by means of the printing press, you can print many svarim, and through this, ki lo tishakach, ki pizaro, Torah won't be forgotten. And where's the source? What was this kind of already brought down in the Torah? Ba'azeh mitnabe Yaakov Avinu kshavirach et Yehuda. And Yaakov Avinu blessed the shevet Yehuda, and we all know that Yehuda is, from him comes Mashiach, it's the line of Mashiach. Lo yasu shevet mi Yehuda u'mechokek mi ben raglav ad ki avo shilo. Mechokek ze hatfus. Someone that's an engraver, he means here engraving onto a piece of paper, right? That's the tfus, that's the printing press. Shehit nabe. The Yaakov Yehuda prophesied. Lo yasu shevet mi Yehuda ze bechinat shevet sofrim. The sofrim. The sofrim of Am Yisrael. מבחינת כתיבת ספרים הקדושים של התורה, הוא מחוקק זה מבחינת הדפוס, שתתגלה חוכמס הדפוס בעולם ולא תתפטר חקיקת והדפסת ספרי ישראל עד כי יבוא שילה. אינטור שילה, דא שילה זה משיח. אינטור משיח קאמס. We will use the art of the printing press. We prefer the printing press. We have to be in thought about this. There was spam upon spam, the pages upon pages. Anyone that's ever dabbled in any of the, the spam in Brussels see that there's a yam, a yam, a yam, a yam. Every day, the more and more spam based on the Torahs that Reb Nassim provided for us and presented for us. And this is a Mashiach sinner, the more and more spam that are here, that keep us in mind with the Gula, with where we're heading to. So I just want to give us all a bracha to take advantage of all the avodas of Kodesh that was done and that was used in Tonan with all the malacha of the avodas of the Svarim. And to have enough gods to believe that maybe my avoda is more Yitzchak than Avraham. Meaning, maybe I'm not here to bring about something that never existed before, but maybe the way in which I extract what was already placed before me is what the whole world is waiting for, to be able to understand what came before me. This is the Nesola, this is, this is the Shemesh, and this is the Levana. This is what the sun and the moon are all about. 
And I heard a teacher of Chaim Kramer say like this. And he should have a lot of tzlacha right now on his current trip in the States. He said like this. We all know that the Rebbe and the Talmud is like the Shemesh and the Lamas of the sun and the moon. You can't look directly at the moon, but you're completely burnt. If you just look at the moon directly, it's too bright. You need the reflection of the moon in order to understand what the power of the sun is all about. And then he said in, a, in the greatest mansion in the world, that's exactly what it must have been for you and I. How much of Paris I told we have tonight, that when we have this yam of feeling so connected to something so deeply, the schus of the tzaddik Rabbi Natan, who was most of his nefesh to be the greatest moon that Am Yisrael has had, the greatest moon, the reflective light, the orthosent, that's the north through which everything can come. So all the children here, and the adults that are still very much connected, hopefully, to the, the child of him. Alavai, alavai, ten chalkim in Yitzchak Avinu. Our chilet should be with Yitzchak Avinu. And it should actually bring us a lot of symptom. But that's our topic of the world. This nigga was very ill now. After a very powerful davening. Thank you. 
much better. <laughs> 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 Thank you. 
It's been a while since I, since I'm listening to man that you hear that was like a few years ago. Yeah, you were in the basement somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> Things have changed. <laughs> Just a little bit. Oh, yeah. all, good, all good student, they start out in the basement somewhere, you know, what the is okay. We always be a little student. Yeah, it's not the shame. It's not the shame. So I was, I said, we heard from me already plenty of night for the even all the time, but I want to open up the gate for what we're going to do. This. We've been learned, we learned many times the following teaching. And it's something I've learned, I personally learned from you a lot, and uh, many have. And I want to just bring it to the surface because I think it's the Nakuda of tonight. It's the Nakuda of our whole lives, but this is the Nakuda definitely of Nassim's yard site. Ilula is the following. We learned from another Sefer, the beloved Mishkan Evnen, that there's only one thing in the world that when a person dabbles for, Hashem always says yes. It's meaning, Hashem always answers, but the answer quite often is no. Because it's for our benefit. We can't understand it. But there's only one thing that if we have enough guts to daven for, the answer is always, always, always yes. And that feeling, what's so, that's like, when you want to know what that is? What is it? So the love he says is that when a Jew asks for more and more, Hashem always says yes, because there's no serious, there's no reality. But Hashem says, I don't think it's so good for you. When it comes to, you know, money, all other things, it's like, you can't understand it, but you having that won't, won't be good for you. But there's no reality in the world where a Jew says, Yolam Hashem, where Hashem's like, you don't really need that to, do, to, to figure things out. It's just not put out so much in your face, but if Nassim puts it straight out in Tfila after Tfila, and you look at now this is something that is one of the greatest, greatest privileges to do in this world, to ask to have more and more. So I just want to say, you know, Hashem should give you a lot of cough. And he said, don't make it. To keep on asking for a moment, you do it so beautifully, and you have to use your eyes to ask for a moment. That's what you want to ask, but I want to bring down with you tonight. Yeah, no. We take this day. How do we, how do we, how do we share this? Thank you so much, Rabbi Shlomo. Thank you, everybody, for coming here tonight. Those who are regulars, those who are not regulars, we should all be regulars, and also not a regular book of Shem, not as much as I'd love to. But Rabnasan, Rabnasan, book of Shem, was Mamash a gift that the world still has yet to understand what a gift Rabnasan was. It's Nasan, not time. Shem gave us something. And a lot of times, when the Shem gives us something, especially the, the most precious things that there are in the world, they get overlooked a lot. Like a few of these crazy Hasidim that were sitting over here in Breslau that had some type of demyonis <laughs> about their Rebbe. And all of a sudden, here we are years later, and apart from the regular, maybe 60 to 80,000 that actually do make it to Rosh Hashanah, there's a bunch of guys at home in Rosh Hashanah upset with the wife that she didn't let him go. So maybe a million guys <laughs> sitting at home, upset they couldn't make it to a woman Rosh Hashanah, right? How did Rav Nachman know? How did Rav Nassim know? How did they know? Speaking of Ramuna, Rav Nassim says, it's right down in the Kok Veor, Rav Nassim says that I believe, I mean, I mean, they that every single year wants to serve Hashem. No matter what his mouth says, even if he says the complete opposite, that that person wants to serve Hashem. And he also said, I just like the title, Rabbi Yochanan, I can't remember Rabbi Yochanan, if not, somebody else can help him with addresses. I know where it is in the press of the book. Nasa said that I can go and walk into any single year's basement in Shemayim, and I can get them off. Compared to anybody. This is because only I know how hard it is in this generation 
and the previous generations that I can walk in, but I believe in myself enough that I can stand before a Shemiz Brach and whoever else is up on the, on the, on, on the for the judgment there, all the tzaddikim, Malach, whoever's standing there, I can get them off. Because I believe, for sure, that I know all the nisyonis that a person has to go through this generation. This is very lesson. I was here many years ago and had the pleasure of spending Shabbos with Rabbi Shlomo here and his family. He probably doesn't remember that he told me, but I remember this. He said that his, his daughter had a thought that perhaps maybe there was no real Rabbi Nathan and there was only Rabbi Nathan. You remember this? And Rabbi Nathan was hiding. He was like a savvy mister within. He's hiding himself in this very Nathan character. He's like making the whole thing up, but it's really all Rabbi Nathan. You, you remember this? She was on to something. <laughs> I don't know if it was beauty, be you, because uh, well, I do think that she was on to something. Because as much as Ram Nassim understood the, the secret of Rabbi Nathan, to the degree that he understood it, he knew that he was a lot of years away from understanding the Rebbe. However, Rav Nassim had something that Rav Nachman himself didn't have. Think about this. He was a he was kosher, he was okay, he checks a lot of boxes. But he had something that Rav Nachman did not have. He had Rav Nachman. But David said on himself, you're so lucky, I wish I had a Rebbe like me. <laughs> Doesn't sound good in 2022. Probably didn't sound good then either. But, he said, but I didn't have a me, and you get to have a me. Rav Nassim understood something. When he was reprimanded by Rebbeinu for his Pagama de Muna that he had, if anybody knows, he didn't tell Rav Nassim that you didn't have a Muna in Hashem. That you have a Chisar in your Muna in Hashem, it's not shameless. There's a different reason why he wasn't shut in. He said, if you didn't believe in yourself, you don't believe in yourself. Man. The moon that most of us struggle with before we can even become a leader, before, before we can ever believe in Hashem, is that we don't believe in ourselves. We don't believe in our own God. We don't believe that Hashem is willing to stop the whole entire creation, all of the Bria, just for every single one of us. I mean, Nachman says, Sikhot Aran, he says, and I ask you, why did you allow the world to be destroyed? When did I allow the, the world to be destroyed? He says, did you not know that when the Yid stops and they cry out to Hashem in sincerity, when a person cries out to Hashem, that all of the judgments, all of the different Plates, whatever she was going to be busy with in the world, he stops everything to go and listen to that one child. And a person can have the belief in themselves that at the time that I stop and I separate myself from the world and I go and scream out to Hashem, I'm mamish saving the world. The whole world depends on my feelings. A novice is in the Gemara, the person says that the whole entire world should, should, should. Should the whole entire world was made just for me. Well, I'm losing the Hebrew he, he right now. He says over there that that means that a person should say to himself that whatever I see, if he's someone in the world, that I have to dive in on it. I have to pray on it. It's up to me. It's up to me. It's like the Asked the Rebel many years ago. I heard about it, Noam Ali Melech. I've heard it after the, some of these mices, the Siddish mices go out in a few years. Everybody heard about their report. I heard about the Noam Ali Melech. And they asked the question if anything in the world can be used for some type of good, so maybe what do we do with kafir? What do we do with atheism? He says that at the time when a person is being pressed and they're in need, we don't now go say, oh, I should have helped him. We'll go dabble about it. You be, act like a co-friend. Act like there is no shame. You go around and help your brother. 
the whole entire world depends on our Abuna and ourselves, that we have to believe in ourselves. That Hashem wants to draw us in, Hashem wants to bring us closer. The world over the last few years, we've seen, it's been crazy. <laughs> over the last few years, now everybody knows that it's crazy. This is what it is. And if you haven't paid attention to that, you may be crazy. And the more and more we descend, we go into a deeper, deeper star. It feels as if Hashem is not there. But the endless is Hashem is more present now than He's ever been. Like the Bill of Abbey says, Hashem is more tangible now than He's ever been. And many generations before, they had to do all different types of sabuf and, and different things. And this generation, this is the generation where Nathan says in Sifat Quran, he says that in the generation before the coming of Mashiach, a simple Jew with a Muna is going to be like the Baal Shem Tov in this time. That's how much of a of the Muna we're going to have before the coming of Mashiach. And before he comes, the Bilbulim are going to be crazy. The world is going to flip upside like I said. And even the Bali and the people that are strong in their Muna are going to be affected by what they see. He said that in the end, they will persevere. And he said, by my camera, for sure, it's just going to be like a dream. Because I gave them such a gift. I was giving them a gift the whole time I was here. It's called these moments. I taught them the path. The difference, they say, when a person can recognize the Amos and a person can't recognize the Amos, in between, what's the distinction between what Shek and what's Amos? I was one time, I remember our I remember we were sitting one time, I think Ellie was there also to a leader. There was a question that came in, they said that sometimes I feel very pushed to do something, even to be a mitzvah. And it's loud, and I, and I feel very, very strongly like I have to do this thing. But even though the thing appears to be like it's a very good thing, it's a mitzvah, I have also another voice telling me not to do that thing. How do I know it's the truth? How do I know what's shaken? Brilliant answer I heard from Rabbi Rosh. He said, anything that's loud and persistent and is screaming is the voice of the Sitra it says, in Malachim, when Hashem asked Eliyahu Manavi, after the earthquake, is Hashem in the earthquake? Is Hashem in the wind? It's no. Hashem's voice is always a small, still, quiet voice. Hashem's never on the side of lachats. Lachats. Even if it seems like it's a mitzvah. But this is the way of the world, that when one is dealing with the mahu of the bull confusion, and it's very, very hard to have the, not only the Kesha of the Shem, it's very, very hard for a person to have the Muna that we need in order for us to transcend, and to be able to have the Kesha of the Shem that we're supposed to, which is dependent on our Muna, the highest level of connection that a person can have is to believe and to know that the Shem is there, that this Muna becomes something very tangible and real, and then you see the Shabbat says that it's two sides of one point. There's a Muna on one side, a Bitaqan on the other side. And a person has a complete package. I can have a Muna. I had a Muna when I came up here and I sat down and I acted in Bitaqan. I sat down in this chair. I did not look at the chair. I think we talked about this a few years ago. I told you at one time we were saying this in Rosh Hashanah, you know. And as I'm saying it, the chair breaks and says, oh, fell down. You bring me the <laughs> Seems like they're done. Okay. Cheers. Cheers to that one. But by this, we have a moment. You see the shadow brings you. We have a moment. It may be misplaced, maybe over here, maybe over there. But we're not able to direct it to where it needs to be. Most people didn't look at the chair. You may look at the chair to see if it had stains on it before you this video. Worried about the worried about my pepper, but I definitely did not look to see 
and see that you were stable if it would hold me or not. It was instant. I could sit down and I know that the chair is going to hold me. If we don't have this type of relationship with Hashem, there's a defect in the relationship with Hashem. Very far from where we ought to be. But it's not our fault. How could it be our fault? When Nassim would argue, no, Hashem, it's not their fault. I'm not going to get us off from this. But each person has to do our own job. I came to Breslau, and I've been asked many different times to share this story. After I finished telling my story, but I was asked, well, how did you get to Breslau? And I'll make that a main point. I probably think this is the perfect time to be able to tell the story I came to Breslau. <coughs> I started my journey into Yiddishkeit on fire. I was looking for a shame. I don't know what it was since I was a young boy that had a very deep yearning and connection to be close to God and to know what God was. Only time God really came up was if the adults in the house got drunk enough that they start talking about God. I don't know if anybody else does. Pour them every day, no for sure. <laughs> However, I don't know where this thing came from, but it wax and wane. People would talk about it. I was very interested. The first religion I knew was this one. My grandfather was a Sunni Muslim. It's the first connection to any religion. He ended up going to prison. By the time I was 13 years old, I had a friend who invited me to an after school program at a Christian camp, at an after school program by a Christian organization which eventually led to me after developing a great relationship with him, I went to camp, I became a Christian. And I wasn't just any type of Christian, I was a Bible-thumping Christian, like very serious. And later on in my high school years, it only got worse. I became a junior missionary, they gave me smicha. <laughs> and it wasn't long before I had more than half of the high school that I was attending, going to all the different after-school programs. I became the poster child for this place. And I was on fire. I ended up getting into an altercation with another artist many years later. I fast forward because I want to get to the other juicy stuff. And I ended up finding myself back into this dark hole and being in a kill or be killed situation with another rapper. And I escaped this by many, many tefillas. I was crying out to God. It was my natural response after faking to be a, a gangster rapper that was being more gangster than what I really was and ended up in an altercation that was life threatening. After this, I went to my naturals and was to pray. It should have made a miracle for me that that individual called me. And the reason why I say it's a miracle is because where I come from, nobody ever calls you to ask you if you're trying to kill them or not. Just not a <laughs> question that they could ask you. <laughs> and that very next year, unfortunately, I lost many friends. Many friends from situations that could have been ended with a phone call. And I know for sure because almost every single person I'm almost certain every single person I knew out of the maybe 10 closer friends that I had were killed by other friends that I knew. And I grew up with both guys. Easy conversations. Made me realize how much more so of a miracle that it was that it should allow for this other person to call me. So after this, I owe a a great deal. I owe my entire life. So I went back into Christianity. And while I'm there, decided to start picking up the Bible. And obviously, the things are not lining up. Things are not matching the same way that they used to. Because now, when there's nobody else to give me an interpretation of what it is that I'm reading, I'm reading, and it keeps talking all these beautiful pasukim that they used to talk about in the church. I'm talking about Jewish people. There's no word church in them. So now I've got a major confusion. So I did what any other brilliant smart person would do. I went to google.com and I started typing in stuff. And uh, just like everybody else, I've said it many other times, anytime you go to Google and start typing in Jewish things, Chabad.org comes up. Yeah. Thank God for Chabad.org. They also pop up everywhere. 
also too hard. <laughs> about the work of the So this is the introduction into, into Yiddishkeit. And to make a long story short, this led me onto this journey of trying to find the Emmas. I just want an Emmas. I always say that when people start to search, to conduct a search for Hashem, for faith, for Muna, for religion, there's many different ways to conduct that search. There's one way a person can search because you know, I belong to a particular religion. I was raised a certain way. But over there, I'm not allowed to do everything that I want to do the way I want to. So this can't really be God because society says this. So now I need to go and find a God that fits what society says. Or I now need to go and find a different God because I'm unable to accept certain things based upon my own personal worldview. I have a worldview that's been given to me, also probably from the news and from TV, from movies, whatever. And so now I need to go and find something that matches my worldview. Or like everybody else, a new I'll just be spiritual. I'm just spiritual. The most not spiritual people are people that say, I'm just spiritual, by the way. I just want to put that out there. So, for me, myself, I want a different death. I went on a path to go and find a Hashem, and no matter what I believed or whatever I knew before, I had such a yearning to find God, to find the, find out the truth, that I was willing to accept anything that didn't match my world. Anything that I knew, I put everything on the line. Everything on the line. I remember taking a Tanakh, setting it on the table, after coming to the conclusion that what I knew before was not what I actually knew, this was all something that wasn't endless. And I remember sitting it down on the table, and I said to I said to Hashem, said the God at the time, I said, I'm going to read this book from cover to cover, but I'm reading it only so I can know you. I want to know what you love. I want to know what you hate, I want to know what you wore, what you punish. I just want to know you. This is it. This is after my process of elimination. I was sitting eight hours every single day. Eight hours every single day with a few different versions of the Christian Bible. I had a Quran, I had the, the JPS Tanakh, and I had a, had a Homish, and I'm going through all these different texts. I was fasting three days in a row. I was going without food. I would take a week, three days in a row. I was going out crying to my eyes with bloodshot red, begging that shit for the truth. Begging for the truth. I came to a very, very interesting conclusion. One of the biggest conclusions was that maybe geared me at least towards the path of Yiddish Bank or something that's not so novel. Unfortunately, most Yidden who are called the people of the book never read the book. So they don't know what's happening inside the book. <laughs> the book's Tanakh, guys. You go to Yeshiva, guys, they have no idea. You don't want to know what some of the conversations I just had over the last two weeks. About Tanakh, the truth is. The people of the book, they're not reading the book. Because if you read the book, you can't help but to see the Hashimas that the Jewish people have in the eyes of Hashem. I came to a very, very in interesting conclusion. That the integrity of Hashem's whole entire existence is based upon the fact that this is Jewish people. I grew up in a place in a school. I never heard anything about Jewish history. I didn't know anything about Jewish history except for I lived in a neighborhood that were Jews. They go to Jews go to church on Saturday. That's all I knew. I didn't know anything about the Holocaust. For sure, not any pogroms, not Inquisition, not this, not that. I knew nothing. So the only time I'm able to learn about Jewish history, as at the time I'm learning about Yiddish Shire. So, just like any, uh, you know, uh, great Bible thumping uh, Christian who's coming into the light of Yiddish Shire, they're spending all the time where? In eschatology. They're looking at all the Navi to find out what the end time things is going to be. I mean, to prove what's endless and what's not. Hashem is obsessed with Amnesty. Scientists today, 
are very busy always trying to prove or disprove Hashem based on science. Hashem says that the way you're going to know me is that if you look up and at the end of time, there's going to be this nation that I've been screaming about for all these 24 books. If they're still here, then that's the proof that I exist. I came to a conclusion that there's for sure no way in the world that they could be a Jewish people if there wasn't a Hashem. I'm sorry, I know you guys have been saying Vishanda, many of you for many of your lives, whether you're from or not from, everybody's been saying it. For me, this is the biggest kiddush in the world. The Jewish people have had beef with every single nation you don't want to have beef with, right? We've had problems with. And to be able to still exist, this was the big light that went off into my head as I'm reading, spending all the time in the being. So I'm increasing the moon, I'm spilling, building, building more time, building a moon and a shim, and a surrounding Amisim. So as I mentioned, I'm spending all this time in Tefillah, and I'm simple, I don't know anything yet. I never heard of Torah Shabbat Pei, you imagine this, right? So I'm reading through Shemot, and I'm seeing the building of the Mishnah, and I'm seeing all the details. I see all the detail, I have no idea what nothing means. We also still don't know anything what nothing means. But still, I have no idea of nothing. So I made a conclusion in my mind, came to the conclusion that a shit likes for things to be in a sudar, and likes to be in order. So I started lighting candles in my house. And I started to light incense and have a room in my house. And I didn't know anything about it or nothing. Nothing about it is about it in itself. And I was spending hours every day talking to Hashem in my room, building a place for Hashem. Because I just read Hashem. God's obsessed. He's so much so that he's in so detailed on all of this that it must be that I have to build, build a place for Hashem. On fire. And every day is another revelation, and another place, and another place that I'm coming to when I go to Hashem at that point, and another revelation won't be mine. And then all of a sudden, we come to the place where me and my wife decide we want to make a gamers. And there's no other thing that can put your fire out fast than walking into an Orthodox community. <laughs> After reading Tanakh, and touching all the Jews based on what you just read in Tanakh, and then walking in to the Orthodox community where everybody's like, listen buddy, relax. Go to the cool level, talk to Rabbi so-and-so, chill out. And we have nothing to do. What, what do I do with all this fire? Because on every page that I'm reading, on every single page, but in every story, somebody's crying out their shit. And the way that I was reading Tanakh was that I was looking for what's the expectation of the relationship? What do I have to give? And what am I supposed to receive back from Hashem? When it says that in Hashem was with Shmuel and Ali, what does that mean? And if they wrote a book on me, would they say that Hashem was with Nisi? What was he doing? What was David Amalek doing? What made him Matsuya? Why did Hashem love him so much? This is all I was busy with trying to figure out a way that I can make Hashem love me the same way as everybody I'm reading about. And I crave this, and I yearn for this. I just wanted that I was also going to be loved by Hashem just the same way that these people did. If you want a big boost for your mother, learn to not. Look at the relationships that Hashem has with the individuals inside of Tanakh. And look for what the expectation is supposed to be. If I devote myself to you, Hashem, what is it supposed to look like? What is it supposed to feel like? It's a deep enough saying it. But what you might have said is, even in the Bayan Rafat, the safe was taken off right now. We shouldn't be going too long without feeling the Kirlas Hashem. It's time to Hashem hides himself from us. But if we live in a life, but there's no hair, we didn't feel that closest to Hashem, 
That's not what the relationship is supposed to be like. We have to go bang on this gate to figure out what's going on. Abba, why are you not here? But in order to get there, we have to have the Muna and the Shem really wants us. And the Shem really wants to come close to us. So I was in my in my place over there trying to figure out why is nobody just as excited as I am about anything else I've read. Nobody's like, you know, talk. I want to talk to Shem. They have this book, it's got all these prayers in it. You understand? And everybody's saying them fast. I don't tell them I'm a rapper because <laughs> they're rapping every morning. <laughs> Not just to fill it. <laughs> so just being honest, coming from the outside in, right? Does anybody know? Because we all have these scoopers where we feel this, this, this shame. What am I doing this for? What am I doing this for? What am I doing this for? It wasn't until it was one circus. Long before even I was my guy, a few years before I was my guy. That was a uh, weekday we by my rabbi's house, and he had this book called The Garden of Peace. So I started reading it, and the book's fine. But he keeps talking about talking to Hashem, talking to Hashem, talking to Hashem. Maybe not what it says, maybe not what it says. So I finished this book, and as she mentioned, by the time I got it, I was going 100 miles per hour. My wife was going about 35 in uh, residential in terms of our, our growth. After I read it, she was going 150. I'm still trying to catch up. <laughs> that was, not because I read the book, but because after I took it, I started going out every day, spending an hour on my shalom bias. One hour every single day, I was going out crying to shit on my shalom. I go find the McCord. And meanwhile, my, my, my brother-in-law was also on the journey with me at the time, one of my best friends, was, uh, started reading, started listening to the Shiram from, from Nassim Maimon. So now, we're, we're being approached by this idea of, of Rebbe Nachman, and I still have no idea what it is. So finally, all, after all this quoting, he goes, and he's mentioning this book, Lepid De Maran, I go and open it, and as fast as I open it, I close it. I didn't understand anything that was going on inside of it. So, a couple of years later, I came across the book, Ishtar Kutanefesh, The Outpouring of the Soul. And it's very interesting, the introduction to the Misilai Yishan, the Ramaphal says that I'm not teaching you any fiducia. I'm not giving you anything you don't already know. I'm telling you something that you already know. When I read Hashtabhut and Nefesh, it was like I knew every single thing in the book. There was nothing ever more close or more such of an aha moment than when I was reading that book about crying out to Hashem in simplicity. And I said, I knew I wasn't crazy. I knew I wasn't crazy. They told me I was crazy, but I knew I wasn't crazy. So reading Hashtabhut and Nefesh, then I get a Shiva's nefesh, and I'm falling in love. That fire that they tried to pull down started burning again. It started burning very, very loud. And I had the wonderful opportunity within this time to make a Kesha, Rabbi Lazar Brody, and Rabbi, and Rabbi Arush. And a week, maybe after I had met them, I ended up going to him to swell for my first time. And I remember being in there to scroll my first time. It was just fire. Now I knew, for me, it was a pilot trip. My wife thought I was just going to go see, but I know I was on a pilot trip. And I will never forget the first opportunity for these boaters that I had was a Shmuel and Ami, the Kevin Shmuel and Ami. And I'm sitting out there in the fields, just crying, spending so much time with the ship. It was such fire. And everything had come to completion, and everything that I already knew on how to find this shim, how I, how I got to here, I got to this shim, was that I was crying out to Hashem. That's how I was able to find the endless, is because I was crying to Hashem. So, right before I leave Eretz Israel, I have an email from the White House 
Assistant President Obama and the First Lady are inviting you to come to the White House for a Hanukkah party. And I didn't even know the guy knew who I was. I had no shikers to him, no nothing. So I get this email, and now I don't know if I should go or if I shouldn't go. So I called a good friend of mine who was close to Rav Arush, and I said, should I go? And of course, it was Rav Arush, he said, yes, but take him to the Garden of Amuna. I don't know how that's that. So, Rabbi Laser brought me in the range for me. The next week I was in LA to get a copy of the Universal Garden of Ramona, so I'm on my way now to the White House. We decided we're going to stay in Silver Spring, which was you know, not so far from DC. We had a host over there that was willing to host us, and they weren't making a suit of Friday night. So we had to figure out a place for Friday nights. My Rebbe, Rebbe Shmuel Brody, was originally from Silver Spring. I called him, he said he would look around for me. And then between the time, because it was getting close to the shop, I called Chabad. I said, you guys have a suit on it. He said, sure, you, you can come. Right after I get off the phone, my Rebbe calls me. He says, I have the perfect place for you. I said, oh, I called Chabad. He got very quiet. He said, don't do this. I, I got a place, I got a place for you. I said, Rebbe, I'm gonna go to the closest place because the guy who's with me, his foot was swollen. It was mom was swollen, and he can't walk that far. So whichever place is closer. So back then, I Google mapped it, and I seen that the place that my Rebbe told me was much closer. So I called Rabbi and said, I'm gonna go, and this is the reason why. So I ended up going to Rabbi Chen in Silver Spring, a beautiful minion downstairs. And I'm there, and I see there's a breast of book on the shelf. Called Seventh Heaven from Rabbi Kramer. <clears throat> I go and grab the book, start to read it. Davening's about to start. I just set the book down and I'm down. I get to down, down. It's completely quiet. People still davening. <coughs> and one guy goes, psst, psst, in the basement, by the way. Everybody's davening. It's completely quiet. And he goes, psst, psst, like nobody heard him. And I go, hmm, hmm. And he goes, is that your book? <laughs> and just like you can hear me, everybody heard him. Is that your book? He's whispering. And I go, hmm. He said, where'd you get it from? I point, point to the back of the shelf. It's quiet. He goes, psst, psst. I go, hmm, hmm. Are you Nisim Black? <laughs> and I go, oh, my goodness. No, no. And I go, mm -hmm. he goes, I'm Laser Brody's brother. So I look at him. Almost easy. That was um, if you don't know this yet, he's Gishma. So I look at him, he looks just like Laser Brody, a little shorter. Each other, but he looks like Laser Brody. And after we're done dominating, whatever, he tells me that every day after dominating, I learn from my Kutay Maran. So he says, let's learn. So what do we learn? What is he up to? Torah Gimel. Torah Gimel is about Nagim, about music. So we sit down and we start learning this Torah. First time I'm able to actually touch the Lakutim Maran, because I, I, before I didn't understand Chinese. So I'm learning with him. My head goes, Phew. and I'm looking at how big, how big my knocking was. And after, I think it was Shabbos, it was a beautiful, snowy week in Silver Spring. I went out from a show with the deers, and I was in the forest in the back, and I was bawling. I didn't even look at the clock, spending so much time with the shim. And I started thanking the shim for my fire. I shim, I thought I lost my fire, and he gave me back my fire. And I was there for maybe two hours, and I didn't feel anything. I didn't feel the cold. It's the most peaceful. I, I, I recommend anybody going out to talk this shit in the snow. It's something so peaceful about the snow. And I remember that whole next year, it's just almost like a ringer in my ear now. It was almost every single week I got a call from Zed Zolman, Laser Bully's brother. Did you get your tickets to Uman yet? <laughs> every week. 
Did you get your tickets to Uman yet? Did you get your tickets to Uman yet? By the way, I didn't even have your shoes for my wife. No permission. Did you get your tickets to Uman yet? So in the end, the next year, I ended up going to Uman, Rosh Hashanah. And I don't have to tell you what happens over there, but uh, big lights, very big lights. And I remember I read Torah Aleph. It was the first time going to Torah Aleph, and I had it in, in English at the Rev. Framework. And I just sat with that Torah. And that whole week was the highest week that I probably had experienced ever in my life. And I don't know how, because in the world of Gashmus, it was a complete disaster because my luggage didn't come until 11 days after I got back to Seattle. I'm not gonna tell you what I wore, but I wore it every day. And I'm gonna tell you what the mikvah looked like. So the Gashmus, it was a disaster, but in the spiritual, something high, I remember coming back, and my wife said to me, what happened there? I said, I don't know. She said, does that mean we're breast lovers? I said, yes. <laughs> and I've been to Uman that year and many other years. And as great and as beautiful as it is to be by the Rebbe, there's a very high, concentrated fire that happens when you cross over and go to the city of Breslov and go to Reb Nassim's cabin. Perhaps I've heard it said because Reb Nassim is closer to our level. He's that bridge in between us and the band. So because of that, the fire is a lot more tangible over there. And I told him this that it could be true because when I go to Heron, it's also hard for me over there. But Sfas, I can do Sfas. I can go. There's something about being over there where there's this world of the Buddha. And when I go to Rav he smooths everything out. Everything out. And over the years, Baruch Hashem, my life has been a different life. It's not that everything is peachy and creamy. But I have, because of my devotion to Tefillah and my devotion to the Sephora of the Nassim and the Nachman, I have so much ammunition for you reader that they're scared to come. I have so much ammunition against you reader that they're scared to come. They still come, but they're scared to come because once a person loads up on Ramnasi and they load up on the Sephora of Rabbeinu, then you have a fire that's not going to burn until the Shia comes. And Muna is a muscle. You have to build it. I used to, when I was back in high school, I was the first guy in the gym, last guy out of the gym. Now I don't see a gym. But back when I was in high school, first guy in, last guy out. I was bench pressing 405 pounds in the 10th grade. <clears throat> Ask the guys, ladies, how strong that is. <clears throat> Crazy weight. <clears throat> and it's only because every single day, I was there working, pumping iron, pushing. With our mother, it's the exact same thing. Everybody, that, that, that knows me, or that knows me, knows me because of Hashem Aleph, they've been with Hashem Aleph. The song Hashem Aleph, by the time this song came out, I had just completed six hours every single day for 22 days in the forest, crying out to Hashem. I didn't know where my next dollar was coming from. I was three months behind on my rent. I was working for Kolel in a not so Torah city, but whatever the case is, I quit everything, I dropped everything because I knew that I had to go and run for the shim. I was every single day spending that time. I would not recommend it to some Joe Shaw off the streets. Or, or Yosef. Yosef. Off the streets. <clears throat> because that Mrs. Nefesh came because I believed that Hashem was going to rescue me. And I only believed that Hashem was going to rescue me 
because I looked at every other time that I threw myself on the shim from the little times that I'm able to depend on the shim on the big times. The moon is a muscle. You have to work on it. It's not going to come overnight. I was just now in America with the shim and had the opportunity to meet so many different people. I did 18 shows in two weeks. I'm exhausted. I'm still jet lagged. 18 shows in two weeks. All over and it wasn't, I was on the plane every day except for showers. <clears throat> and I love my manager, but I was going from New York to LA, back to New York, then to San Diego. Like, you can imagine what I'm going through as I'm talking to you. The whole entire time I'm there, I kid you not. The last, obviously last week, it's kind of, I'm fighting every single day to light candles. You don't understand what I had to go through just to light candles. Some of these were two, three, four gigs in a day. And just to light candles. Before Chatzois, after Chatzois. <laughs> Before I went to Shaka. Mamash, fighting to be able to light candles. Mamash, fighting. Being away. And I realized something during this whole entire time. I was talking to Hashem, and I, and I realized something. He even, even came in the stronger after I got back. My, my first is going to some shops. And I realized something. I said, Hashem, I can cry, and I can beg you to give, beg you to give me more money and to draw me closer. And I said, Hashem, but the Amos is, you want that I'm going to be closer to you more than I want that I want to be closer to you. And I'm thinking to Hashem that with every single Yerida, every single hard time, everything that I ever had in my life, Hashem, with everything, my time, Hashem, what am I doing with my time? Speak to you real. Abba? I don't mean to, but sometimes I feel like I'm destroying myself. I feel like I'm destroying myself. I'm fighting an uphill battle all the time. Shit, look what I have to go through to, to light candles. I'm fighting. But Hashem, I'm just flesh and blood. It's hard for me. But you, on the other hand, Hashem, if, if it's true that really you want me closer to you than I can possibly ever want to have a run to come closer to you, the fact, Hashem, that you're seeing me struggle and you're seeing me fall over and over again has to be hurting you more than it's hurting me. So Abba, why are you doing this to yourself? Why are you putting yourself through so much pain? Why would you do that to yourself? You deserve only the best. And the best for you, I should have said, you draw me close and you give me more of them. This is what's best for you. Because it's a big part of your to me that you're hurting when I'm not close to you. You're hurting whenever I'm hurting. And you're sharing my exact pain on a greater levels than what I could possibly ever imagine. So Shannon, why are you doing this to yourself? Why are you doing this to you? Don't do it to you. Don't do it for me, do it for you. I shouldn't do it for you. Somebody said to me while I was on this trip that I don't reveal was so amazing that he could stop us to feel us with the ship and go and run to someone else. I said, it's not just the godless of Abraham Avinu just being a bond woman. You have to realize what type of passion he had with a ship 
to know that he can tell him, Tati, I'll be back. A person that just knows the godless of Hashem, but he doesn't know Hashem, will feel fear. Will never say to Hashem, ah, I'll be right back. He understands it's the godless of Hashem. He will never say, Hashem, I'll be back. I have to go help some. No, he will never say it. He realized he's standing before Hashem. So they tell the mice, I'm going to end with a very famous one every year in Uman. They see two guys in purple, they have a breast lover and another guy prepping for the Rosh Hashanah. And again, he naturally he would be, he's doing all different type of hachanas, preparing for Rosh Hashanah, it's judgment day. So he's building inside of his heart all of the fear that he needs to have in his heart because he's going before judgment. And in the distance he sees this crazy press lover dancing, smiling. <laughs> See, it's Rosh Hashanah is coming up. Looks like this guy is wasting his time. What could you be doing? And he's smiling and he's dancing and he's getting ready and Rosh Hashanah is coming up. So finally they see each other, and he says to the other guy, he says, why do you have such a long face? Why are you so, so scared? So he says, because I'm going before the king, and I'm going to be judged. I'm going before him, and I'm a man, I'm, I believe that Hashem is a true king, and he's a righteous judge. Why should I not be scared? I should turn on. I have to prepare myself, sleep all them, do everything I can. Is it the you look like you're, you're playing a game over here? Why are you smiling? What's, what's, what's going to be so happy about? Do you not realize you're going before the judge of all the earth? And what he answered was the Kiddush of Rav Nachman and Rav Nassim. He says, yes, it's true. I'm about to go before the judge. I'm going before the king. There's one small caveat. The judge is my father. It's my dad. The moon of the is when I know that the king, the judge, is my father. And it's a different type of relationship. We should all be so good to know I should be our father. He's a melech, he's our king, he should be so good to have a moon of Shlema, a kid of Hashem. We should always be to have the Vegas. We should feel the light, the awe of Hashem, and be able to attach on, attach ourselves to that light of Hashem, even amidst a whole lot of darkness. Is that the shit? Amen. Thank you. 